So it was May 31st in 2009 that my dad went from Antarctica to Hawaii. Now, what, what do you mean by that? Did he live in Antarctica? No. Let me explain. Uh, that's kind of figuratively because a few weeks prior, so I announced this at the church that I was at because I had received a message in the early before the services that I had received a phone call letting, my, letting me know that my dad had passed away. And that was a, it was a few weeks ago to the church that I had preached about heaven. And I said, why is it that we think, and I said, Where, where's the worst place in the earth to live on earth? And, you know, Antarctica was one. There might be others. And, and besides Sturgeon Bay, what was the best place? And besides Appleton, what's the best place? And people said, well, Hawaii. So why do we think that we're living in Hawaii going to Antarctica when we're really living in Antarctica going to Hawaii when we pass away? And, you know, sometimes we forget about that and we kind of get into that sense of, and now, you know, God gives us a will to live. And so I shared that that day. And, and uh, of course, I got that right before the services. I mean, about eight o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, I think. And I went out and prayed and cried and then went, preached two services and then went to be with my mother. Obviously, we experienced the, the, the grief of his loss, but I was worried about my mother. My mother lives in a small town, Nakusa, where I grew up in. And she doesn't drive. And so I'm thinking, well, is she going to be able to live in, in, in our house? But she's done amazingly well. And, and, and I think one of the reasons is because she participated in what I want to call good grief. Good grief. Not good grief, Charlie Brown. Remember that for those. Of, but the issue is, and I think today I want to talk about that because today's a transition time from Pastor Mark uh, resigning after 41 years, and, and now he's not here. And, you know, that's a big deal. You know, I transitioned after almost 24 years of planting a church in the Appleton area, and then, you know, so that was a big deal uh, for, for, for myself and for the church as well, and so I can understand it. So I want to talk about loss. There are different kinds of loss, and we've all experienced loss, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of financial finances, you know, the stock market or whatever. In 1989, I lost the hearing in my right ear. I was sitting down, I got up. I lost the hearing in my right ear. They say from a leaking of the inner ear or whatever. And so different kinds of loss that we've experienced. And there's different levels of loss. Think about the hurricanes the last two, you know, last couple of weeks. Hurricane Helene, Hurricane Milton, and the different levels. My sister, and by the way, Ryan, I want to say it's a miracle that that contractor did that in Florida because my sister and brother live in Florida, and they've had more problems with contractors than you can you can save. So whoever you find, hang on to because that that that's, that is a miracle in a lot of ways. And and so that, that so we have some that my sister lost a few branches and things in Orlando, but then the others are flooded out, and people lost homes, lost lives, different levels of loss that we experience. And so I want to talk to you about loss and your loss, especially as a church, but also you individually. 41 years is a long time. Some of you, Pastor Mark is all, all you know as your pastor. Some of you were maybe even dedicated and even married by them, they buried your parents and, and, and whatever. And so, it, that, so there's that sense of it's different. It's different. And so... And for them, too. Today, they're not here. And they're probably thinking, what's happening here? And, and I, I know they're still in the journey of determining what God has for them. So that's the obvious things that, that I want to talk about. But also, there's many other kinds of loss that you have experienced and maybe are experiencing and will experience because we know this, that loss is inevitable. But grief is a choice. How we grieve is a choice. And so, so last week, Pastor Mark preached his last message, and he called it Paradox to Paradise. So I want to tie off on that paradox when it comes to loss, because grief 
becomes good when loss brings gain. Grief becomes good when loss brings gain. In other words, I know Pastor Mark has encouraged you saying, hey, the best is yet to come and come and he's believing God and he talked about a revival that God wants to do and we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But that whole idea that it's not going to be the same, but it doesn't mean it can't be better. Now, I realize that's hard to grasp because you're still walking through. And, and you know, I would say this, and I've listened to some of his messages and how I preach it, and I would say he's kind of a gourmet preacher. You know, he's a gourmet because he's, you know, he's, he's very, he's a feeler. He, obviously, he's a thinker too, but he's, he's an actor in a sense. And so my wife is the actor in our family. I just act up. So when, I've, so when I've been played roles, it's always had to fit who I am because I can't, I can't act for anything. But I can act up. And, and, and so that's the part of it. So my, my style is just kind of meat and potatoes. Kind of what you see is what you get and, and just not a lot of fluff and, and whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, so you, and I've learned years ago, just I have to excel at who I am. And I, I'm a dry humor guy, so guess what? If you laugh or you just groan, that's okay. Either one's good. It's when you don't do anything that's a problem when it comes to the dry humor. How many of you like dry humor? Okay. Well, good. That's good. We'll be, we'll do, well, and it just flows for me. I can't help it. It's kind of how God made me. So we really, Jesus spoke about how loss becomes gain in Matthew 10, 39. He says, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And then he says in John 12, 24, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So loss can become gain if we handle it correctly in our life. Because it's in our trials that God wants us to grow. The goal is not to just get through trials or get through loss. It's to grow, it's to grow in it. It's to grow in it. So God, what do you want to do in me in this time? What are you doing in me? What a bless the, the worship team. What a great job today, even though it was like this is that was changed, but then they do a great job. And I was really impressed because you have three men singers. Most places have three women singers and a guy that tries to carry a tune. And that's big. Because guys, you know, guys singing is like, you know, unless it's a good country song or, or whatever, you know, that on the back road during deer hunting, when they've had maybe a little bit too much to imbibe on, then they'll sing. So it's great to see that. But with God's help, I saw my mother game during time of loss. I wasn't sure she was going to be able to stay there. She's been there 15 years. She's 92, still lives in the same big house. In fact, I'm going tomorrow because they're reshingling the house because of hail damage. So I'm going tomorrow to just make sure things go well there. I kind of take care of that part of it. And so, but she's doing, and, beca- and also, but I want you to know the church was a big part of it because they would help her get right. I mean, my brother lived has a, uh, a business in Wisconsin Rapids, but he couldn't always be there. But pe- church people came around and helped her, helped her take, take her where she needed to go, get groceries and things like that. And, and being a part of a church and her ability to serve, all those things helped her. I'm, I've just been amazed about God. And not only that, she came out of her shell and did things that she didn't do before. And so I, I've really, I've seen God at first hand turn loss into gain. And, 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 and so I'm excited about that, what God wants to do in you. And so with God's help and your right choices, your loss, not only as individuals, but uh, as a church, can be gain if we make good choices. So I want this time of transition to not be a stumbling block for you, but a stepping stone of going to the next level of what God wants to do in you. Because now your faith, in a sense, when there's loss... My mother didn't have it to lean on, my dad to lean on. By the way, let me just share how my dad died. It was on Saturday, May 30th, that my dad got up and he went out and worked in the garden, which he loved to do. He went fishing with a friend, which he loved to do. Took my mom grocery shopping, had supper, watched the brewers, kissed her goodnight, and woke up in heaven. I mean, what a way to go. Now, it would have been better if the brewers would have won, but I mean, I don't know if they did. <laughs> 
I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know. But the point is, I thought, man, I, and I, I, and so my, I really, I never had a, a problem how that happened. I said, man, that, that's the way to go. Because if my dad would have had a stroke, right. my mom wouldn't be able to take care of him. And then how does she go see him and all that? I mean, right. it, it was an amazing thing in a lot of ways how, how God did that. And so you, 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 I never second guessed that. It was interesting. My dad had big feet. Bigger, you know, he's like size 14s. I, I wear 11s. So I could have my shoes on and I could put my, my shoe into his shoe. I said, I can't fill his shoes, but I can follow in his steps. Yeah, and so I, same with Pastor Mark. No one's going to replace him, but in God's help, they're going to follow him yeah. and going to take you to another level. And God's going to use the gifts that they have to help not only this church be healthy and growing, but to reach this community who desperately needs Jesus in a time when the world is drifting further and further. You see, the way to save America is to save Americans. It's not going to be a political thing, even though we need to steward that vote. It's going to see people's lives change. They're going to change policy. They're going to change lives. That's God's way. That's, that's, free. that's not even about this message. So that... So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have to, had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And that ties into the other message that was given today about praise and to the glory of God. And so how we handle loss in our life and, and how we make it and let it refine us and make us in who God wants us to be, it gives glory and honor and praise to God. These, these people were exiled believers. Think about some of the people that lost their homes in North Carolina. There was one day it was there, the next day it was gone. And now they don't even know what they're going to do, where they're going to live. And these people had lost their home and they were exiled. Because verse 1 says that in 1 Peter 1, they were exiled. So they didn't have their home, they didn't have their family, they probably lost their livelihood. They were believers in Christ, therefore they were suffering for their faith because they were in a land that, that, you know, that was that way. So this is what they were at, what they were going through. So 1 Peter 5, Peter in, intimates four stumbling blocks that can hinder gain from being, um, loss from being gain, can hinder gain from, from, being, from coming into, from because of loss in our life. And I want to share those today. The first stumbling block it's what I call vulnerability. Vulnerability. Loss can make us vulnerable because change and pain is involved. Maybe you are, have had or are having this experience. In fact, you know, vulnerability is not all bad because a lot of times when people have loss and things go bad, people actually think about it's out of their control and they actually think about Jesus and, and bringing him into their life. And so a lot of people come to the Lord when things are bad, right? And so that's not all bad. But other times, vulnerability can, is a time when people can prey on people. We see that happen, especially during when, when loss, when someone loses a loved one. You know, it's very, they're very open to, to someone scamming them or whatever because they're vulnerable at that time. And as believers, there's a vulnerability that happens even to a greater level, and that is we're open to the enemy of getting a foothold in our life. Because the stability that Pastor Mark brought for 41 years, as, and he was a, a mentor, a friend, a pastor, and now no longer here, and now what, what do I do And when something goes wrong or whatever? And so the enemy is looking for a way to get a foothold in your life and an open door in your life and in the church at this time. Because when the shepherd goes, the sheep, he wants to scatter them. So the tendency is there to be somewhat vulnerable. But this is what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. He says, be alert and of sober mind. 
Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers through the, throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Now, maybe you watched on National Geographic channel or, or on YouTube a lion going after its prey and stalking and looking for the weak link or looking for the one that's all alone. Right? That's what they're going to look for. Did you ever watch a flock of geese in a field and you study them? Do you notice they always have sentries? A lot of them are eating, but they have sentries pointing and so and watching. And because when something comes, they will alert and they'll trade off. And so you can see that. And so that's why the church is so important that we have as sentries and guarding. If you if you sense somebody drifting in their faith, and maybe because of change, and maybe thinking about not coming or backing away or whatever, that's where you need to be on top of it and be alert because the enemy wants to get a foothold. And you know, this is we're in it for the long haul. When you're part of the body, everyone's needed. It's important at this time not to get scattered, but to draw closer together through this shared need that you have. You see, the devil is your enemy. He's looking for ways to get a foothold in your life and in the church. We can see what happens in, over the past couple of years of, of leaders that have fallen for a variety of reasons and how that affects people. That's why praying for your pastors, and by the way, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of your pastoral appreciation next week, but for Carol and Craig, it's, it's, it's all that they've done. For me, it's by faith. <laughs> you're, you're honoring me for two weeks. <laughs> so believing that down the road, I'll, I'll fulfill that. So I'm taking that. Uh, I, I, it's by faith. But actually, God, God wants to do it by faith. Think about the, the cultural pressures in this world to conform to the pattern of this world that come at us to give up what God says in his word. In fact, I just someone just shared with me in, in the ELCA, a, a transvestite pastor in the ELCA Lutheran Church, that said the Bible is not is no longer uh, uh, fit for the, the this war this year uh, uh, 2024. It doesn't fit, and I'm like, last time I checked, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Last time I checked, He doesn't change. Last time I checked, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. You see, if there is no truth you stand upon, what do you stand? You're standing on quicksand. What do you? So who? You know, it was said by uh, Hillary Clinton that all disinformation, anybody that spreads disinformation, should be put in jail. And I thought. I thought all political, I thought, and it, it, it was just about all political ads, should, the people that do this should all be in jail because <laughs> they're all half-truths. Then I thought, well, okay, I'll be the one to determine what's, in, what's the right information or not, right? Who determines that? The Bible, God determines that. Yes. Not, God determines that. Anyway, so help me if I get off on these tangents because I, I, I kind of get off on them. And so pastoral transition is a, tri- a prime time to become vulnerable because of change and uncertainty. Now, what is he? The Holy Spirit says, be of sober mind. It means to think straight. The Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. We need to look at things from God's perspective. Don't just see the short term. See the big picture. Don't just see what is now, but a year from now, seeing a new pastor and the new things that God wants to do, not only in you and in this church, but in this community. That's what you need to see. Think spiritually. Set your things on minds on things above, not on things on earthly things. Think big picture. You're not the only one going through this. There are people in the, around this world and in our country going through worse things than, than we're going through right now. It says, be alert, be aware. Second Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, for we're not unaware of his schemes, speaking of the devil's schemes. You know his schemes. You see, his way is to get you to believe his lie is truth because then he gets a foothold and gets bondage in your life. So become aware of how he works and be alert, be aware of where you're vulnerable. If you were guarding a city and you had three fortified walls, where would you put most of your troops? 
on the wall that wasn't fortified. So be understand and let the Holy Spirit reveal to you where are your vulnerabilities? Where do you get off when you start going down that downward spiral? Anybody know what that means? When you start getting that stinking thinking, anybody have any of that? And what is it that gets you going down that? Fortify that. Yeah. And then he says, stand firm in the faith. Hallelujah. By the way, this isn't Pastor Mark's church. This is Jesus' church. He was an under shepherd, and and I'm here to help in that in journey and to fill that role for a period of time. And we need to know the devil is a liar, and so he wants you to believe his lies. The Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm in the word of God. You need to hide it in your heart so you don't sin against him. You need to meditate on it day and night because then you're like a tree that's planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prosper. Think about when Satan tempted Jesus. How did he overcome? He had the word of God and he spoke it out. Even if Jesus needed that, how much more do we need that to stand firm in the faith? And then it, and then it says, resist him. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, we need to remind something. Satan's defeated. Now he wants you to think he's not. We need to remind him in the authority of Jesus, he's defeated because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we need to remind him, when we remind ourselves of that and knowing that we're dead. The Bible says we're crucified with Christ. That means temptation comes our way. I'm dead to that. Bible In Romans 6, it says, reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. So resist him. Be led, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you today, where are you most vulnerable in your life? When does a guard get let down? When? What about in the time of pastoral transition? What has maybe happened over the last week or a couple of weeks of thinking about the future or whatever? Where are you vulnerable? And make sure that your vulnerability leads you to God and not away from him. That's the big thing. The second stumbling block is this, pride. You may wonder, what does pride have to do with going through a period of loss and grief? Well, because what happens is when we go through a trial in our life, we find out what we really believe and and who we really trust. And sometimes we we revert back to our old ways and we put ourselves on the throne and take Jesus off because we're hurt. And and sometimes the enemy wants to come and get us to blame God and, and saying, I expected me to be gone before Pastor Mark was gone. Oh, and and, then saying, why did that happen? And even, by the way, even though something is right and God's in it, it doesn't mean there isn't still the humanity of the the grief and loss. Because that's the reality of it. So I'm not telling you that you don't grieve. I'm just helping you grieve in the right way and not allow these, these stumbling blocks to get into your way. And that is... Don't start doing it in your own strength. Don't start going, reverting back to, to you, but making sure that Jesus is still on the throne of your life. There's some pride indicators that, that we can look at, and sometimes they're covert. We don't even know. One of them is fear. Fear, what's, you know, what's going to happen next? Who's it going to be, and how do I going to fit in, and am I going to like him or her or whatever? There's Because Fear, pride is at the root of fear and anxiety. There's entitlement. Sometimes we think when we're going through a trial or loss, we're like, I didn't, I didn't deserve this. I mean, when I lost a hearing in my ear, I was pastoring at the time. It was Good Friday, 1989. I was sitting down and I got up and all of a sudden a ringing in my ear and I lost the hearing in my ear. I'm like, what? I didn't deserve that. Well, And we live in such a world of entitlement. We can't let that creep into the church. I deserve this. I was talking to a family here about that when I was here, uh, uh, one of the messages I preached about, you know, moving to a different seat. You know, and they said, man, it was really hard. I just moved over one seat and that was difficult, you know. (laughs) We get, because, you know, I said, maybe like the airlines, we should charge more for, the, those seats in the back and less up here that we get more people up front. But just, just a thought. 
So entitlement can be a part of pride. Ingratitude. How many times the, the temptation to come our way to be upset about what we no longer have until thank God for what we do have. I think one of the things that you see about Christians that go through these tornadoes and, and hurricanes where they say, I'm thankful that I'm alive. I'm thankful that we have our family, everybody's okay. And in some cases, there was one case, I don't know if you saw that, there were two houses together, families that lived close to each other and both houses washed away. All 11 people were killed of that same family. Talk about dealing with that today. That's a Job-like experience. We need to continue in prayer for them and be participating however we can. And then one big thing about pride that you can determine what happens is prayerlessness. Prayerlessness is confidence in yourself. And what happens in our life is that when we first come to the Lord, Lord, I need you for everything. And after a while, you know, I can kind of do it myself. You know, I can preach a sermon in my own strength. But it doesn't accomplish anything for God unless the Holy Spirit's in it and he, and he speaks through people. So it's that whole idea of humility and prayer. It's a big part. I was challenged yesterday as I was reading about uh, this gentleman who is leading uh, uh, ministry in India. And he said the people there fast and prayed, fast and prayed two to three hours a day for the lost that they, in their world. But man, I was convicted and humbled. Of course, we can say, well, I don't have the time. Well, we got all these other things that are you know, supposed to give us more time, right? All these other amenities, and it seems like the more we have, more we got to do. But I was just convicted about the level of prayer that I have versus theirs. Now, obviously, we got to work that through ourselves, but prayerlessness is pride. So what's the antidote? First Peter 5 Chapter 5 and uh, verse 5 and 6. All, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. He says, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Humility is lowliness of mind, thinking more of others than yourself. The word clothe there in the original language, had to do with tying a knot or a bow in related to putting on an apron that a slave would put on or somebody that would like a, that if you would do at work, if you're in a wood, working shop, wood shop or a, an apron cooking a meal or whatever, and it speaks of clothing yourself, tying humility around yourself with one another, which means, hey, being willing to serve. One of the reasons my mom could grieve well and had good grief is because she committed to Bethesda, a, a, a thrift store, and went there two to three times a week and served. And she just loved doing that. And that helped her to grieve well because she, she just put herself into serving. And that's the message you said, Ren. Giving and you'll give back. And God has blessed her. And so don't back away. Now's the time to pitch in because there's more needs and more. You know, Pastor Mark's not here. What he did, now the leadership has to pick it up. And that means other things they're doing, other people have to pick up. And guess what? That's clothing ourselves with humility. And that protects us because we don't get into this uh, mode of receiving. We realize you receive best when you give. Think about Jesus where it says in Paul when he said in Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say that Jesus, who being very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Say it with me. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. What does a servant do? Ding, 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 ding. So that's wherever you go. I want to tell you something. In God's kingdom, remember the two chairs? In God's kingdom, when you learn this principle, it will change your life. 
Because you will see, guess what? When you serve others, they're blessed and you're blessed because that's the Holy Spirit putting you in unity. So walk in the attitude of service. So the next time you go to the grocery store and you see a cart sitting out in the middle of nowhere, grab it and take it into the store. Or someone needs help, whatever. The little things, doesn't matter. Some, and, and during Christmas shopping and you're racing for that one spot with somebody else, let them have it. I mean, let them have the spot. <laughs> That's the dry humor stuff. You see, loss can become a stomach block when pride takes over. And pride can creep in here because now all of a sudden leaders are gone and people are kind of saying, hey, you know, we're going to we have a little power struggle. Mate. You know, not that there is here. I appreciate the leadership here. But that's the danger that we have to be aware of. Third, stomach block number three. I need to move along. Anxiety. Loss means change. Change with uncertainty becomes a breeding ground for anxiety and worry. When I was here before, I told you that my son-in-law had been diagnosed with acute leukemia. He went down to Freighter Hospital. And, uh, and last Thursday, five weeks later, they said he's in remission. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! So I believe that, he's, that God's healed him. So, I mean, the issue is what they say. Some people say, what's well, not curable? I say, or sometimes they say things aren't curable. I say, yeah, but they're healable. From man's perspective. But here's the thing. When my daughter got all the information, got this, you know, the, the diagnosis, all of a sudden anxiety and worry. Is he going to die? And then it hit her. How much is this going to cost? And then how is this going to affect future and family and all this kind of, all this anxiety stuff starts creeping in to our life. How many can relate to that? One time I preached a message called Compound W for the Worry Ward. You know, the, the whole aspect of how worry can creep into our life. And, and what good is it? I remember the, the movie Bridge of Spies. I'm not sure if I shared this here or not. I, you know, I, I'm in different places. so Plus, I'm getting older, so sometimes you repeat the same thing. But anyway, Bridge of Spies. Anybody see that movie with Tom Hanks? And, 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 and the, this, this Russian spy was caught by the Americans and, and they were arranging a trade with some other Americans that were caught by the Russians. And Tom Hanks is talking to this gentleman, the Russian spy, and he's so calm and he says, man, do you know what's happening? Because there's a very good possibility that he's going to be killed if he goes back to Russia because he was caught. And he says, doesn't this bother you? I mean, doesn't it whatever? And... And the man generally said to him, would it help? He said, aren't you worried? You're anxious? He said, would it help? How many know worry doesn't help? How many know that actually worry actually affects you physically and emotionally and spiritually? And how many know that worry is unbelief? So it's unhelpful, it's unreasonable, it's unhealthy. But First Peter said here, First Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, interesting to note, cast means, the, the, the word means to, like throwing a blanket over a donkey or a horse or a mule. So it's taking all of your anxiety and putting it on God. First of all, to know this, that God cares about me. Say it with me. God cares about me. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm a social security number to our, to our I'm just a number to our country. But God knows how my hairs are on my head and how many I lost last week. So he cares about me, but not, he doesn't just care about me. He cares for me. There's a big difference. You can care about somebody and not care for them. He says, I'm going to take care of you. If you put me first, I will take care of you. Matthew 6, 6, he says, hey, why do you worry about the things you wear, the things you eat, what you wear? Even, you know, God clothes and takes care of birds. He'll take care of you. But what you have to do is take that anxiety, like health issues, like who's going to win the election, like marriage issues, relational issues, job issues, future, and give them to 
to him. Give me the next slide. You can draw this on the back of your sermon notes. What you do is draw, a, a, make a cross. And on top of the left-hand side, you say prayer list, what I cannot control. The other side is the practice list, what I can control. How many of you know that anxiety and worry and frustration and anger come when we focus on what we can't control? How many of you got upset over a political ad on TV this week? <laughs> Reacted to it, okay? Hey, I've been there. But I can't control that, can I? So here's the deal. Then I write down what I can control. I, control, I can control my attitude. Now here, let me ask you, Carol, can anyone make you mad? I can. Okay, yeah, okay, you can. <laughs> here's the deal. Nobody can make you mad unless you let them. Because I, I mean, I'll tell this to people, I go, yes, they can. Because they, they put, how many of you have button pushers in your life that come and try to, that's their life's, that's their life's goal. <laughs> and here's the thing, they do that to control you. So the person, they want you to react because when you react, they control you. So when you don't react, they turn, up the, they turn it up because they want to control you. But here's the thing, those things, focus, write down those things that you can control and focus on that. And, all, and what can you control? I can control the circle of I'm standing and who's standing in there. That's what I can control. I can't control whether my, life, my wife loves me. I can control if I love her. So, and we're, we're getting, we'll come back to that. So the last stumbling block is negativity. Times of loss and uncertainty can cultivate a spirit of negativity evidenced in doubt, unbelief, skepticism, cynicism. Think of, you know, it's amazing the disciples that Jesus picked. You had Simon the Zealot and then you had a tax collector. You had the religious zealot and then a tax collector who has looked at the lower and low. Then you had Thomas. Oh, Thomas. I'll believe it. When I see it. Well, let's go with him because it's a Lazarus and we'll go die with him. Thomas. And yeah, Thomas, by the way, he's, he's they, they, they actually say what ha the, the spiritual aspect and awakening in India way back when it was all because Thomas made it. So it's interesting to note that how God, aren't you glad God changes our life that we don't have to remain in negativity? But how many of you know what it means to, how many of you know what it's like to hang around somebody that you come in and they have a great day and their, their, their goal in your life is to pop your balloon? <laughs> to suck the air out of your life. Pray for them, right? But don't be like that. But that's what the enemy wants. All of a sudden we become cynical. And he starts putting these negative thoughts in you, like maybe I'm not going to like the person that comes, a pastor, or maybe it's not going to, whatever, maybe whatever. And we don't even know. We only have today. Right. So First Peter says this, and this I challenge you with, 5, 10, 11, and the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. You need to trust God to restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast in the middle of a trial, in the middle of loss, so that loss becomes gain. We need to believe God and trust God that he works all things together for his good. We need to trust God that he's going to make you stronger in this time. We need to trust God that he's going to help this church grow in this time, and you're going to grow in this time. We need to believe God because he's working in us. It might not, it's not going to be the same, but it can be better. And that's what I encourage you with. So I remind you that grief becomes good when loss brings gain. And so the application is this, catch and release. I mean, you know what catch and release is? You go fishing, you catch a fish and you release it. Now I like to take them home and fry them up and eat them, but sometimes they're too big or they, or they don't fit the slot or whatever. This is what catch and release is. What I want you to do is to catch all of those concerns and anxieties and worries and things that you have in your life right now. Maybe that card's not big enough. Whatever, come, whatever the Holy Spirit puts to your mind, and I want you to write those on that card. Okay? It's kind of like, and then we're going to cast them. We're going to release them 
to the Lord. And by doing that, you'll picture that that's the blanket that you're going to lay over the Lord. I'm casting all my anxiety on him and, and the anxiety of something hit me from behind if it whatever hits. But And then as, there were, as they are leading us in the song, Draw Me Close to You, I have this bucket here. I want you to release those concerns, those anxieties, those worries, those issues that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about and put them in this bucket. Now, I'm not going to read them. It's like I want you to picture yourself in a sense if it was a blanket and just, and by the way, casting is not the fishing cast where you throw it and you reel it back. Because how many of us have done this before? We give it to the Lord and then right away we take it back. This is visual thing that I'm just, Lord, I'm casting on you and I'm walking away with peace and confidence and faith and knowing that you're going to work it out according to your glory and honor. Okay? So as they're leading in this and you write them down, when you have them written down, just come and place them here. And then let's just sing the song, Draw Me Close, because that's what the Lord is doing. Because, you know, that anxiety and those concerns can keep us distance from God. But when we take care of that, then the Holy Spirit can just work in our life because we're, there's freedom. Now, there's one more story that I would tell that's called the care bucket, where a guy came in to a pastor's office and he had all these concerns. And he says, I want you to think about a care bucket. And you put it up and he said, I want you to think about all the cares that you have and I want you to put them in. And so that's what he did. And he said, now I want you to carry it out. And when you get outside, I want you to just release it. And so he looked out his window. The pastor looks outside the window. And the guy walked out and he just released it. And he raised his hands to the Lord. So when you release those to the Lord, I want you to just raise your hands to the Lord and worship. Say, Lord, I give them to you. Lord, I give you all my concerns and I receive your peace. I receive your confidence. I receive your ability to move forward and to, re and to gain in my time of loss in the church's time as well. God bless you as you do that. Draw me close to you. So if you have ready, come bring it Never let me go. Nothing else. 
else can take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace help me find a way bring me back to you worship center and you care for family worship center in each one. So Father in Jesus name as we walk out we walk out with a sense of peace and confidence and knowing that you're working and looking for it doesn't mean that we're not still going to work through emotions and challenges and whatever. It's just knowing God that you're working and you're and you're bringing all things together for your good. And Lord, when we're going to be able to look back and see your hand in it all and give glory and honor to you. And so now I pray, God, that you go with, we go before each one to lead and guide them this week, walk behind them to protect them, walk with them to encourage them and to inspire them and instruct them in the path that they should go in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen.